What up, Dollface? It's Dev. SBMTG, we like it a magic, and we especially like it a magic. During those rare times when a card comes along that reignites our passion for deck building, even in a slog of a standard. A card that any deck can play and sits at the nexus point between, oh, I wonder what we can do with this in competitive. That looks interesting. And also, this card is very bad, stupid, bonkers, banana pudding jank. And Crimson Val gave us just such a card in Dollhouse of Horrors, a card that hits on pretty much every level. It's the perfect mix of cute and also kind of spoopy, but also look at the fun stuff you can do with this card. It's kind of like an Offspring's Revenge, but just better in just about every conceivable way. And even at a casting cost of five whole mana, which I think we can all agree is a lot to spend on a card not named Goldspan Dragon in the current standard, the card is still really tempting. And obviously, given the right tools, has the potential to be more broken than a lawn chair I'm attempting to sit in. So today, let's talk about a completely comprehensive, exhaustive guide to Dollhouse of Horrors. We're finally doing this video. We finally... I'm sorry alchemy happened. I had to talk about that. But we finally get to do this video. Let's go. Welcome to and we're back. Hey, if you enjoy this content, why don't you consider giving me a sub? I'd like that. That's all I'll say about it. Not a sandwich. Although I'll take a sandwich, to be honest, right? If I had 124,000 sub sandwiches, I'd be set for life. So if you want to give me a sandwich, it's fine. But you don't have to go spending money on sandwiches for me. Just It's free to subscribe, so do that instead. But let's go ahead. Start to start hammering this bad boy out. How do you play with Dollhouse of Horrors? How do you play with that card? What's good, right? So I think the best way to do this is to run through the colors and talk about each card in standard that works well, or in some cases, not as well as you might think, <laughs> with Dollhouse of Horrors. And I'm going to start. Usually I go through the color pie, and for some reason the color pie goes like white, blue, black, red, green. I don't know why it does that. Well, I do know why it does that. It's because if you look at the back of a magic card, that's how it goes clockwise from the top. Why? Right. That's why you have to do that. But I go through the color pie in order all the time, and I'm tired of it. So instead, I'm going to start with green. Let's start with the back of the bottom of the color pie. And work out why don't we do it differently? Because green actually has some of the absolute best things you can be doing with this card right now. Now, since we're talking about green first, I should probably go ahead and mention the insect in the room because Scoot Swarm is probably the most popular thing that people are doing with Dollhouse of Horrors right now. And doing the boot scoot and boogie makes plenty of sense considering how these cards line up with one another. For one, I like that you can play your Dollhouse on turn five and then on the next turn when you untap, you can just get a Scoot Swarm out of the graveyard and then play your land. And theoretically, that should be your sixth land. So you'll get a copy of Scoot Swarm in that case. But one of the coolest things about this little combo right here is that when you play lands beyond your sixth land and make copies of Scoot Swarm, they'll all be constructs. So your Scoot Swarms will get really, really big really fast. Now I know this combo might look a little, um, cute. It's probably the right word to a lot of people, but in practice, once you actually get in there with it and get the combo going, it is not uncommon within just a turn or two to have five, five, five Scoots out. And that's really difficult to deal with. But green has a ton of other tricks up its sleeve, and I honestly think it's just about the best color that you can play with if you want to build Dollhouse right now. If you employ green, you get things like Prosperous Innkeeper, which doesn't look like much, but this helps you get to your Dollhouse a turn earlier, which is, I cannot stress enough, freaking vital in the standard environment. But later in the game, you can reanimate it with Dollhouse, get a treasure, some ramps, some color fixing, and it's often going to come back bigger than it started in terms of power and toughness, which is a good thing. But there's also Cultivator Colossus, a really popular card to see in these decks because you drop it with Dollhouse, you get a butt freaking load of cards. And later in the game, if you top deck it, you just play it and you got a huge guy. But aside from that, something that you may not have seen as often as some of these other cards that I nonetheless think is a a really cool trick is Spirit of the Alder Guard. First of all, something kind of underappreciated about the Snow Bear in this deck is that it goes and gets the fifth land that you actually need to play Dollhouse on the next turn, which is really more important than you might think it is. It's pretty easy to draw that third land, but it's even harder to draw the fourth and especially that fifth land in some games. So this will help you do that. It's better than you think, but even more importantly, when you reanimate this later on in the game, not only do you get the ETB trigger again, but you'll end up with like a 7 or 8 power creature most of the time, which is not something Dollhouse usually gives you. And that doesn't even count all the other constructs from other things that you stuffed and made dolls of. 
Now there's a couple of other green cards I want to touch on before we leave this color. There's things like Toski, which can be pretty difficult to get into your graveyard considering it's indestructible, but you can just mill it into your graveyard with things like Eccentric Farmer, which is another good green card for this deck, or Undead Butler, which is a good black card for this deck, but I just wanted to cover it because it's a self-miller that <laughs> can put a Toski into your yard. Toski's just really awesome for this deck. But there's also things like Tovalar's Huntmaster, which is a pretty sweet card. You just get a 1-1 one, one back with it. But you also get a pair of 2-2s two when it comes into play, so it's not a bad reanimation target. Overall, green is a great choice right now for any dollhouse deck in standard. Not only do you get important stuff, like Prosperous Innkeeper that just helps make your deck work in the first place, but you get to play with cards you don't see every day, like Spirit of the Altar Guard, which just happens to be amazing in this deck, but you also get like the most annoying things that you can do with a dollhouse like Scoot Swarm. But up next is white, and white doesn't have quite as many janky or fun or annoying things that you can do with a dollhouse, but it does get to play a bunch of just good cards. That's one thing, is that one of the only good cards in green that sees play in a lot of other decks that I got to point out so far in this video is Prosperous Innkeeper, but in white, you get a bunch of cards that you'd probably play in your white deck anyway. Things like Intrepid Adversary, Luminarch Aspirant, and Brutal Cathar are all really good picks for your dollhouse deck, mostly because of their ETB triggers. The only exception to that rule on the page right now is Luminarch Aspirant, which comes back at the same power and toughness that it left the battlefield at. And just like Prosperous Innkeeper, depending on how many constructs you have, sometimes it comes back way, way bigger than the last time it was on the battlefield. And it's still going to give you a counter every turn. I mean, again, just all three cards on the screen are cards that you want to play anyway and are just kind of good individually. And that makes them pretty good choices for a dollhouse deck. But White has a couple of other interesting picks, things like Professor of Symbology, which serves as a nice little speed bump, jumps in front of a creature in combat, sometimes trades, extends the game to where you can actually get to Dollhouse of Horrors. And with the ETB trigger, you'll often go and get an Environmental Sciences, which will gain you some life, keep you in the game, and get you a land that you need to help you get to the Dollhouse in the first place. And when you reanimate it, you get to learn for your Mascot Sesibition, which is only a couple of mana away. So just a really cool pick for any dollhouse deck that's going to include white, which I don't think it's going to be every dollhouse deck, but if you are playing dollhouse and you have planes in your deck, good call here. But before we leave white, I should probably bring up Oswald Fiddlebender, which looks like a no-brainer, but there's obviously some deck building restrictions here. You want to play enough creatures to have good stuff to get out of your graveyard with dollhouse, of course. But with Oswald, you need to play enough artifacts to actually be able to spin into a dollhouse of horrors at some point. So I imagine that means playing a number of four drop artifact creatures that you can then spin into dollhouse and get back with dollhouse, right? But there's just not a whole lot of great candidates for that slot right now. So maybe in the future, Oswald will be better. But just helping you get to your first dollhouse theoretically is important and helping you get to multiple dollhouses in a game is incredible because the only thing better than one dollhouse in play is uh, multiple. It's ridiculous when that actually happens. But if your opponent does kill Oswald, which they're highly incentivized to do, just get back with a dollhouse and keep getting dollhouses with it. It seems like a pretty good lock to me, but I'm not sure it's better than some of the other stuff you could be doing. Overall, White actually has some really good picks with Dollhouse, but I'm not sure that Dollhouse is worth playing with all the cards it's good with in White, right? <laughs> I talked about this earlier, but Luminarch Aspirin, Brutal Cathar, Skyclave Apparition, which I didn't bring up earlier, Intrepid Adversary, these are all individually just strong cards that you're going to play in Mono White anyway, but then you have a Mono White Aggro deck really worth using up slots and opportunity costs to play Dollhouse of Horrors. Well, you could just focus on making the deck, you know, more streamlined, faster, lower to the ground. Probably not is the answer. So even though it's really fun to think about mono white or, you know, white X Dollhouse decks, I'm just not sure that you're not actively making your deck worse by putting in Dollhouse. You're definitely not making these creatures any better, which is mostly what you're doing with Dollhouse. A lot of the other colors hinge around playing creatures that you probably wouldn't otherwise play, and white sort of has the unique strength, you'd call it, really, of being able to play a bunch of cards that are just good regardless of whether or not you ever draw a Dollhouse. However, blue has a few cards like that too, like Leer and Holebreaker Horror, which is a pretty stupid card to get back with Dollhouse. It turns out that most of the time, you don't really care about Holebreaker Horror's power and toughness. Like, yeah, it'll end a game in a few pinches of its claws, but that's not actually the hard thing 
about Holebreaker Horror to deal with, <laughs> right? Because with Holebreaker Horror, what you're really worried about is that ridiculous text box. I mean, taken in a vacuum, not accounting for mana cost or card type or whatever. I actually think that Holebreaker Horror's mana box or text box is one of the most oppressive, uh, stupidest <laughs> text boxes <laughs> that exists in Magic today, or even in the last few years. So just having the card on the table, regardless of PT, is uh, stifling for a lot of opponents. Of course, there is a glaring issue here, you may have noticed, because you're a good deck builder and you notice things. And that is that in a dollhouse deck, you want to play a fair number of creatures, right? But Holebreaker and Lear, for that matter, both make you play a good number of instants and sorceries in your deck. Now, I could see, say, a Soul Tie build, for instance, that plays 16 to 20 instants and sorceries, 16 to 20 creatures, and makes this work somehow. It's not unfathomable. Blue has a bunch of other cards that you might want to play if you do that Soul Tie thing, or even if you just want a mono blue Dollhouse of Horrors deck. I guess knock yourself out sounds pretty tough, but you got plenty of things you can be doing, like Mind Flayer, which is probably one of my favorite things you could be doing with Dollhouse right now. Stealing an opponent's creature is fine, right? It's good to have a 3-3 Mind Flayer, but it's really not that much of a difference to have a 1-1 Mind Flayer. And Mind Flayer already has a huge target on its back, so your opponent's probably killed it. You just get it back with Dollhouse, see if they have the second removal spell. That's a lot harder, kid. So I really like the idea of Mind Flayer with Dollhouse, but there's also cool stuff like Jadzi, which puts you in a similar position to Leer and Holebreaker. You have to play a ton of good instants and sorceries to make Jadzi work, but technically, this is probably the cheapest way to get a Jadzi on the table in this standard. But aside from that, you get interesting stuff like Ascendant Spirit and Icebreaker Kraken for snow decks. I really like Spirit because it comes back as a 1-1. Good thing about that is that it starts as a 1-1, one, one, and then you can buff it from there the same way you could if it was just the normal copy of the card. That's actually kind of cool, but Icebreaker Kraken is also obviously super dumb. I mean, it loses all of its power toughness, which isn't good, but if you do it at just the right time, I imagine it can win you games a lot. But aside from that, there's cool stuff to think about, like Kelpie Guide, which isn't the best thing in the world, but at the very least, it's kind of free to reanimate with your dollhouse because dollhouse gives the creature haste that you reanimate with it, or I see Hey, reanimate. That's just kind of shorthand for make a token of, right? But you make a token of Kelpie Guide, it has haste, you can use the Kelpie Guide to tap and then untap your dollhouse and get something else out. And then on subsequent turns, Kelpie Guide gives you two uses of dollhouse. So I don't think that Kelpie is like the best thing in the world you could be doing, but it's definitely cool to think about because two activations of dollhouse a turn is actually really powerful. All in all, blue doesn't have a particularly like widespread of amazing options, but the options it does have are really cool to think about. Again, Holebreaker Horror and Leer, just in and of themselves, are kind of worth putting blue in your dollhouse deck, again, given that you have the proper number of spells to play with those two cards. They are really tempting to put into your dollhouse deck, and so is Mind Flayer, but obviously after Leer and Holebreaker, I think that's where the, the quality of the blue cards kind of drops off, but there's still plenty of cool stuff here. But onto the color with maybe the most cards <laughs> that are cool with Dollhouse of Horrors, right? Because black has a ton of awesome options to discuss. You've got things in black like Tainted Adversary. Again, pretty much any adversary in the cycle is going to be pretty good with a dollhouse because it enters the battlefield as its token and you can still pseudo kick it <laughs> depending on how much mana you have left and the cool thing about dollhouse is that it only ever costs the one mana to activate so you should theoretically have a ton of mana left over to kick these adversaries and tainted adversary is a good one for it you also get counters on your adversaries <laughs> for each time that you kick them which again helps to mitigate the fact that you just got a bunch of a 1-1 one, one guy, right? So, in any case, Acquisitions Expert is actually pretty good, and cards like it, Elder Fang Disciple, and so forth and so on, are actually nice, right? You get them in the early game, get an important card out of your opponent's hand, theoretically make it easier to get to your dollhouse because you got an important card out of your opponent's hand. And then later on, if your opponent still has cards in their hand, give them an Acquisitions Expert or an Elder Fang Disciple. This especially works well in decks like Turgrid, for instance, which is another good card, to get back with your dollhouse because the power toughness does kind of matter on Turgrid, but this is another one where the text box is what matters the most. So if you're going to be playing Turgrid in your dollhouse deck anyway, you might want to think about things like Acquisitions Expert and Elder Fang, which work particularly well with Turgrid. Much like Brutal Cathar and Skyclave Apparition, Black has Gelatinous Cube, which is another pretty interesting option with dollhouse. And I like the way it curves because you'll play Gelatinous Cube on four 
opponent is highly incentivized to kill it. If they do, you play Dollhouse on five, and you can play your cube again on the next turn. And even though cube's just a 1-1, still takes something out, which is always important. There's other stuff, though. And black has a lot of really expensive creatures <laughs> that you can get back with Dollhouse and are really nice. It has a lot of cheap stuff, too. You can get things like Eye Twitch, Shambling Ghast back, and again, you don't lose PT. But you do keep your annoying, stupid creatures that are hard to play through. So <laughs> it's not like there's a shortness of cheap creatures in black to play with your dollhouse. But once you get up to like six mana, that's where you get to really start having fun. You get to play things like Burning Room Demon and get that awesome Enter the Battlefield trigger on it. Cemetery Desecrator, get not only the awesome Enter the Battlefield trigger, but the sweet leaves the battlefield trigger too. When it dies, you should, again, theoretically have a bunch of creatures in your graveyard because you're playing dollhouse and you're probably milling creatures into your yard if you're doing it right. So you should be able to get rid of, you know, a five or six drop creature or something like that, something that you might not want to reanimate with dollhouse depending on the game state. And just kill one of their biggest things <laughs> with Cemetery Desecrators, either into the battlefield or dies trigger. Just a really good card to be playing in Dollhouse. Aside from that, there's things like Dreadhound, <laughs> amazingly. Again, you should be self-milling a lot of the time in these Dollhouse decks. Again, if you're doing it right, if you're a jank lord, you'll be self-milling some of the time. So Dreadhound is really, really, or Dreadhound is really, really sweet. Aside from that, you've got Toxeril once you get to seven mana. <laughs> And even though, again, you lose a lot of power and toughness on Toxreel, this is a card where the text box is what matters most. And after just a couple of turns with the Toxreel in play, your opponent can't even compete with a bunch of 1-1s. So you should end up winning the game if you can keep this board state in place where you got Dollhouse and a Toxreel out. And you're just getting a bunch of cool creatures back from the graveyard every turn. But as the game goes on, your opponent's losing more and more dudes. So... Toxeril is another sweet pick for black, and as I mentioned earlier, there's Undead Butler if you're looking for a card that mills stuff near your yard and can get back something later in the game. Because obviously, sometimes, when Undead Butler dies and you get a dollhouse out, you'll still elect to get a creature card back from your yard and put it in your hand, because you'd rather have the power and toughness and you have the mana by that point in the game to just play it outright anyway, so... Undead Butler is a sweet card, both for the ETB and the Dies trigger. So there's a lot of amazing stuff in black, and it's no wonder why so many Dollhouse decks right now are green and black. Overall, I've pretty much just said everything about black as a color that I mean to say in this portion of the format of the video. Honestly, black not only has some of the most important things that you could be doing with a Dollhouse, some of the most kind of obvious no-brainer, like, oh yeah, that works with Dollhouse. But also, just some of the stupidest, most fun stuff you'd be doing, right? Black has all of these like six and seven mana creatures that you're effectively cheating into play for a power toughness trade. But all those creatures happen to have ridiculous text box, right? <laughs> Things like Toxeril and Turgrid, Dreadhound even, are just really difficult cards to deal with regardless of whatever their PT is. Now, believe it or not, uh, Red just does not have a whole lot of good cards for Dollhouse of Horrors. There are some cool things like Ardent Elementalist, which you really don't care about the power toughness on. You just want to be able to bring back the Blood on the Snow to your hand or whatever. So, Which, by the way, Ardent Elementalist and Blood on the Snow is a pretty hilarious combo in and of itself, but... <laughs> neither here nor there. You can play things like Morog, which is a somewhat popular thing to be doing with your dollhouse deck. Again, you don't really care about the power toughness on Morog a lot of the time. You just want the extra attack steps. So it's not bad, but it's a really difficult card to set up with dollhouse. Aside from that, good old Gary Oldman, Goldspan Dragon, he works pretty well, even though he loses, you know, he gets minus three, minus three. Ostensibly, there are some board states where he gets bigger, depending on how many constructs you have out. But you're almost certainly winning the game at that point anyway. But this is at least something that can give you a lot of mana production over the course of the game, which is something you might want in your dollhouse deck. But I haven't really mentioned this with cards like Mind Flayer and some of the other five drops we've talked about, but obviously your dollhouse is a five drop. So five drop creatures aren't necessarily completely excluded from the deck, but you probably won't be playing too many of them considering you've already got a five drop in your deck. That's pretty much all I got to say about red. There's just not... It's not a whole lot that I like. I don't even like Morog, and that's probably the best thing you could be doing in red. Although, don't, I'm telling you, don't discount Ardent Elementalist. Have you ever even read this card? People just forget this card exists. It's better than you think, but we got to cover gold next. So let's look at those real quick, because there's a lot of cool stuff in gold. Things like Xanathar. Again, 
I'd probably sound like a broken record at this point, but Dollhouse is really best with cards that you don't care about the PT on. And even though, cards like Cultivator Colossus and, you know, Xanathar and a bunch of the other things in this video that I've already talked about, Holebreaker Horror, can kill the opponent in just a few bites under normal circumstances. You don't really care a lot of the times about the power of toughness because that's not what ends the game. And Xanathar is one of those cards. Fun one to have in your back pocket, but you've also got things like Belladross Witherbloom, right? I mean, not the best thing in the world, but a lot of these decks are green black, so don't don't take it as unexpected if somebody drops a Belladross Witherbloom in their graveyard and then later in the game gets it back, untaps everything, has a great time. All of the fun. Right? But aside from that, there's Phylath, which is the actual best red card <laughs> that you can play with Dollhouse of Horrors, right? Because Honestly, you don't really care, again, about the PT on the Pilath. You care about the uh, eventual army of four or five plants that you're making, and it goes especially well in a Scoot Swarm deck that has a bunch of ramp in it, and wouldn't you know it, Scoot Swarm's the most popular creature to play in Dollhouse decks. Honestly, Phylath is probably the actual best red card that you could play with the Dollhouse of Horrors. So if you want to build Jun Dollhouse just to work in Phylath with your Scoot Swarm and your ramp and all that, then uh, I wouldn't blame you. So with all the colors having been gone through at this point, how would I build my Dollhouse deck? Well, I've already brought up a couple of times that a lot of the Dollhouse decks in this format are green and black, and I think there's a reason for that. Now, although I still think there's something to this Soltai idea with Holebreaker Horror, that's not how I've been playing Dollhouse. I've just been playing green, black, and again, leveraging things like not only Scoot Swarm, sorry, i Shouldn't actually apologize. Scoot Swarm's just a really fun card, but I know a lot of you absolutely hate it. But I will take <laughs> the opponents that scoop to Scoot Swarm, which is still a surprising number of opponents. But I'm also obviously using things like Spirit of the Alder Guard, which I pointed out earlier in the video. Prosperous Innkeeper, a very important card. But the addition of Black not only gives you important stuff, but some good fun one ofs Things like Toxeril and Cemetery Desecrator, Dreadhound, while also giving you access to cards like Eye Twitch and Gap. Now, I didn't play a whole lot of instants and sorceries in this deck, but I did choose to play Deadly Dispute. That way we can sacrifice Shambling Gas, and one of the most important things about Shambling Gas and Deadly Dispute, one of the reasons that there's such a good combination in this format, is that they get you to 5 mana by turn 3. That is usually used to play a Loth or a Renin 7, depending on what you're playing against, sometimes even a Goldspan Dragon, but in this deck... That five mana mark is obviously incredibly important. If we can hit Dollhouse on turn three, nothing but good things will happen from then on. But in case you wanted to look at a build that you probably haven't seen, here's a Selesnia Dollhouse build that I've been playing around with a little bit and really liking. You get sort of the best of both worlds here. You get to play these good cards that you want to play anyway, like Intrepid Adversary, Luminarch Aspirin, Brutal Cathar, while also playing all the fun cards that exploit Dollhouse the most, like Scoot Swarm. You also get to do something kind of interesting here, and that is employ sweepers in a deck that's still trying to win off of aggro, right? You can hit a card, like by invitation only, and depending on how many creatures you have out at any given time, if you've been particularly lucky with Scoot Swarm especially, you may be able to sacrifice fewer creatures than your opponent and keep a board state, which is a nice call, but even if you have to wipe your entire board, you still have Dollhouse of Horrors in your deck, and that way you can get back on board or you can just play a Scoot Swarm on the next turn, then play a land, get a couple of Scoot Swarms, and then play an Intrepid Adversary out of your graveyard to give them all plus two plus two, right? So this deck has a lot of really cool lines. It can be the aggro deck, it can be the mid-range deck, it can sort of be the control deck that sweeps the board and then rebuilds. So I have liked a lot of the dimensions to the Selesnia deck so far, too. Give it a try if you haven't yet. But that's all for the Dollhouse of Horrors comprehensive guide. Let me know. If I missed any cards that you like to play in your dollhouse deck down there, there were some cards that I left out of the video because I didn't think they were quite high impact enough to be mentioned, but I did end up mentioning a fair number of low impact things. So let me know if there's something that you wanted to see in this video that I didn't end up putting in. That'll be a fun little extra resource down there in the comments section. Aside from that, just do all the YouTube stuff. Like the video if you feel like it. I hope you do. Aside from that, sub if you haven't done it yet. Trying to get to 125k subs. We are on our way to 3 million, but we got to make it to 125k first, so help me out with that. And uh, you can do any of this stuff down here. We will be streaming on Twitch this week. We skipped a week because uh, I had some stuff going on, and then alchemy happened, and we'll talk about it once we get on stream. But we will be streaming again. Check that out. 
twitch.tv slash spmtgdev. You can also check out the Patreon. Just a dollar a month to support the channel a lot. A dollar a month supports the channel more than you might think, but it also lets you vote on what content we do next. For instance, the patrons voted on this video, in fact. So if you want to be uh, in the Strictly Squad, just throw a dollar in the Patreon pot every month. I feel like I'm probably worth that. But that's all I've really got for this one. So again, get down there to the sideboard and let me know how you felt about everything. And I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, wizards. Spread love and be kind. Oh, heel-toe, dozy-doe. Come on, baby, let's go boot scootin'.